is that changing the world is really, really paralyzing. It can pop you out of the bed in the morning, but sometimes it's just what do I do first? How about changing yourself? That's pretty daunting as well. And sometimes changing ourselves is the scariest thing that we can do, and equally one of the most energizing. So how does one begin? We get people who are inspired, they're ready, they want to take action, or they're absolutely frozen with fear. But in both instances, you've got to start somewhere. And I believe you start with small things, the simple things. That's where you make a difference. The small things have an outsized impact. And I've learned this lesson over and over again. I've learned it from you, I've learned it from my clients, I've learned it from my patients, I've learned it from my life experience. So this book is a codification of the very simple things that you can do that don't take a long time, they don't take any money, but they really, really make a difference. So if you want to start to change the world, to change yourself, what do you do? You connect first. You connect first with yourself, then you connect with others, and then you connect with the wider world. So how did I start writing this book? And as we heard, it's been a journey. Well, I was on a radio show, actually co-hosted and co-developed Women at Work. Our very own Molly Barker had been featured on that show. And somebody else, John Guzerman, had been on that show. And I interviewed him. He had written the Athena Doctrine about the future of leadership and what the world needed. And he turned the questions around. He said to me, so, Dr. Katzman, what book would you want to write? And I said, oh. No, I want to write about millennials and matures coming together to change the world, to be able to be a unifying force because those are the two optimistic um, ends of the spectrum. You go, oh, <laughs> and he happens to be a brand specialist, so I thought maybe he was onto something. I said, well, what book do you want me to write? Of course, we were all pleasers. I wanted to do some right thing for my guest, and he says, I'd like to hear about what you've learned as a psychologist as a coach, consultant, advisor, who has had an opportunity to really get deep into the minds and hearts of people who are leading major organizations and are working in them. What have you seen? And the light bulb went on. I could barely get out of this office when I started scribbling things down. I said, oh, it's really easy. I do the same thing over and over again. I try to tell people, you need to reverse the way you're showing up at work. People come into the office and they kind of slide their card in, they log on, and they assume their work persona. And what people really need is the permission and the ways of stepping out of role and into their own skin. To be able to connect first as fellow humans, and then forge a relationship with colleagues and collaborators. And if we don't get it right at the human level, the rest just doesn't flow. And it sounds so simple. You just have to be human at work. But the reality is it's not so simple. And being natural at work doesn't come naturally. And so this book was written as a way of making it easy, taking the excuse out. One of my clients said to me, I don't have time to be human at work. Well, you know what? She's not the only one who said that. And so everything in this book is simple, it's doable, it costs no money, it takes less than five minutes. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the book came to be. But as I sat and I started writing down all these different ideas, all the different kinds of lessons I've learned. I came up with 68 index cards. Some of you have seen them on my desk. And I was really proud of my 68 lessons that I learned. And I went to a party and I told one of my friends, and he happened to work for Twitter, and he goes, 68? Could it be 52? <laughs> I said, no, I have to be, you know, integral to the data, but let me see. And I started looking, and I thematically was sorting them. I said, yeah, I can make it 52. But once it's 52, then all sorts of things happen. You can have a rule a week. You can have a card deck. You can have a calendar. You can have a corporate campaign. And suddenly, I could see how it's not just a book. It's a mission. It's an execution, a demonstration of my mission, of taking information and seeing how I can drive bigger and bigger impact by bringing it out in, to greater and greater audiences that might be able to engage with the material, share their knowledge, could potentially live online as a repository of information as people try on different ways of working with themselves and with others. So 52 simple ways was, was born. So what are these simple ways? Well, I'm going to tell you about each of them, but let me give you the overview. There's a journey. It starts with respect. The work world is filled with incivility. People treat each other so poorly that it's sometimes we have become so um, hardened that we don't realize. It's saying please, saying, saying thank you. They really matter, showing appreciation, praise, giving feedback. 
These are all really important things, but the book starts with a smile. A smile is actually a hormonal hack. It gets right into your oxytocin system. It actually creates connection. I smile at you, you can't help but smile back. Okay. And it sets off the virus of positive culture, of positive intention. A smile matters. The book starts with a smile, it ends with a dream. But they're really interconnected. So the first part of the book is about really just to develop and respect. And those two magic words are not only please and thank you, but got it. One of the things I ask is just say got it. Somebody sends you a message, don't wait for the perfect response. Actually tell them you got it. Let them know that they didn't just send their ideas, information, project plan into the ether. Say got it, it's a sign of respect. The next part of the book is about using your senses. And this means looking, seeing everybody, being able to actually understand who's in the room because you've seen them, you've touched them. If you touch somebody between their elbow and their shoulder, it probably won't get you a Me Too report, but it will actually ignite enough of a response that somebody is going to comply with you. Data shows that a touch right in this section will actually increase compliance. So we look at really engaging your senses, eating together, being silent together, listening deeply, not to reload, but actually to reflect back to somebody a sense of inspiration and power. And then the next part of the book is about becoming popular. This isn't about middle school domination. It's about being a magnet, being the person that people want to be with. You want to be the person who, when somebody's putting together a team, they want you there. You want your calls to be answered. You want your emails to be responded to. Well, how do you be a generous partner? How do you show up in a generous way, sharing what you know, helping other people shine, helping them be smarter, developing a point of view? So that section really helps you learn to be a magnet. Then grow loyalty. How do you increase trust? How do you actually deal with the many egos that we know are in the room? So there's bits about how to deal with narcissists, because they're everywhere. We all are a little bit narcissistic sometimes. And a lot of egos need a little bit more care than others, and sometimes the most confident people are the ones who are hurting inside. So some psychological tips there. And then there's a, a section on how do we clear conflict? How do we actually get through the hard stuff? Um, and there, people in this room won't be surprised to find that we have quite a bit of information and identification. If you feel it, I feel it. So how do we take that and actually use it to clear conflict? And then we end with leaving a lasting legacy, having an impact, by convening groups together to ask tough questions, by honoring history, by recognizing that there are ways in which the generations can come together. And that dreaming audaciously is the way that you actually start to make a difference. <clears throat> so we really start with respect and we end with a lasting impact. And in the middle, what you would find is very, very specific things that tell you why is this important. There's many rules under each one of those sections. And I have information from science, neurobiology, from linguistics, from philosophers, from army, um, generals and professionals, I have quotes and examples, but I start with research that tells you this is why it's important. And then there's, this is what you do immediately. How do you take action now? And then there's case studies. And the case studies are pulled from all around the world, people at different levels of society, different points in the um, organizational continuum, because the message is that actually we can learn from everybody and we learn from each other. And in the book, the case studies are ones in which a CEO's experience is living right alongside somebody who is working in the kitchen. And the people in this room will know that many of those voices are of our group here and of our hosts. So for example, of course, you can't write a book like this without telling a little bit about Lindsay and her starting Leaders Quest and what that vision was and what it takes to really build an organization. Jane is in the book. She was speed dial six, and now she's our managing partner. How do you move from being the person who you immediately need at all times, no matter what, to continually to being the person you need at all times, no matter what? <laughs> you know, Fields taught us that a point of view is only that, a view from a point. She's there. Kenzie has taught so many lessons about how does one actually bend like a reed in the wind, how sometimes the perfect action is an inaction to be able to sit, to absorb. She's also in the book talking about um, how do you cook with somebody? 
creating food together, being with Daimler and making Chinese food, balancing the spices, getting the yin and yang right. Not only because it seasons the food, but it seasons life. And Max taught us about managing our muchness. How do, how do you show up big, but not too big? How do you not suck up the air in the room, but just give people enough oxygen when they need it? And as I mentioned, of course, Gene is in the book because he's there teaching us about identification and many other tools. And other of you are here, there, but you're going to have to get the book to find out. Um, <laughs> our hosts are in the book. So we've got examples from rare cookies in Mumbai. Fabio Barbosa from Brazil is in the book. Um, Ashwin from Palestine is in the book, talking about the way in which he made the decisions to do what he does. So I hope that the book will also be a gift to our community, a way of really bringing people and their voices together so that they see that we don't just bring them into a room together, we bring them into a book together and create equal value for them. That the people who read this book should be people who can share conversations so that this is a book that you can give to somebody who's a new recruit or somebody who is really experienced in the workplace. They can read it together and compare notes, but to create a shared language so that together people can make changes or they can individually read it. They can pop in and out of the book, pick what they need when they want, think of it as a series of tapas plates, kind of eat as much as you need at the time that you need it. There's guides that show you what you need and tell you if the rule is for you. If you're hiding under the desk, shivering in fear, afraid to go out, there's some ways to enter the room. I have a couple of tricks that I learned from a clown in Brazil. Put your big foot in first and you rap on the door. You don't assume that you have guaranteed entry. Um, and the elegance with which a clown can enter the room is something that I've seen mirrored, believe it or not, with a military man who I brought into communities where nobody knew and watched how he made his way by making people comfortable around him. And that's what you see in the book over and over again. It's a juxtaposition of experiences, but actually the absolute details about what it is that you need to do. So for me, writing this book was an act of love. It was definitely um, a process to get to a point where there were people who were saying, we want to not only read it, we want to buy it. We want to sponsor you and your ideas. Because this is really, in many ways, a codification of what I've learned as a clinician um, and as a coach. Because at the end of the day, what I do is the same thing wherever I go. I try to help people recognize and tap into their fears, but then use that, 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 that room in their belly as really the battery that gets them going. To help people feel less alone and less afraid. That these are the tools that help people do the kinds of things that will make them feel better and alleviate their pain and also increase the joy of the people around them. And the book, I hope, will be a gift to the Leaders Quest community. Certainly, I could not have written this book without the Leaders Quest community, and I hope that going forward, as the book kind of hits the greater world, that we can make the world greater because we've done it together. Mm. Thank you.